I just looked up at the blackboard. If I didn't know any better, I would say that two different people wrote this and this. Because this is a whole lot neater than this. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe I was born in the wrong country. Maybe I should have been Greek. <laughs> Romans 12. The title of the message, Good Theology is Practical. Indeed, I've, heard, I've read it and I've heard it many times that all theology is practical and all theology, if it is truly biblical, mm -hmm. say that. all theology is practical and all practice, if it is truly biblical, is theological. All theology is practical and all practice, if it is truly biblical, is theological. My mouth gets ahead of my brain sometimes. When we come to today's text, Many see a distinction, a distinct break in Paul's writing. We ended last week in chapter 11, verse 36. We're picking up today in chapter 12, verse 1. And many see a break here. In that view, today's text begins the practical section of the letter. The case is made, therefore, refers back to the entirety of of all that Paul's written, not just to chapters 9 through 11. The problem is that if one makes this the beginning of a new section, then it seems that Paul did not finish 1136 like he did 425 and 813. Remember our outline. We've been working off of the question, who are the people of God? The entirety of this letter has been in response to that question, who are the people of God? Paul writes to a divided church. The Jews, who had come back from Pentecost after hearing the preaching of Peter and the Apostles, organically planted this church. It was not planted by Peter. It was not planted by Paul. It was planted by regular folks. At some point, the Jews, including Jewish Christians, were expelled. And overnight, the church changed. No longer was it a Jewish church. It was a Gentile church. But when the Jews are allowed to come back, Gentile Jewish Christians come back as well. And they come back to a Gentile church. And you can imagine, that's not the way we, we did it when we were here before. Well, this is the way we, we've done it since y'all been gone. And you can imagine the friction. Think about the friction that takes place in many churches across our land. So that's why Paul says in Romans 1.16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Who are the people of God? Chapter 1 through 4 we dealt with that. Those who are justified by faith. We also dealt with that in chapters 5 through 8. Those who are united with Christ. And we've been dealing with that in chapters 9, 10, and 11, and we continue to deal with that even here in chapter 12, those to whom Christ is revealed. And the reason I link chapter 12 with the section on 9, 10, and 11 is that when Christ reveals Himself to you, He's going to make a difference in you. He's not going to reveal Himself and leave you as you are. Two 
too many modern churches say, so well, just accept people as they are. Okay? Yes, we do accept people as they are. But as they get into the Word, as they hear the preaching of the Word of God, as the, as the Word of God washes over their hearts, their minds, their enti the entirety of their beings, the Word of God is going to change them. If, if, if a man has been in church for 20 or 30 or 40 years, sitting under sound preaching and has not changed in that time, that man ain't saved. And so that's why I link chapter 12 with chapter 9 and 11. The one to whom Christ is revealed is changed by Christ. And that change is evident. If you and I interpret chapter 12 with the three chapters that precede it, then we have a clear picture of statements like, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Found in chapter 9, verse 6. Or the statement, and so all Israel shall be saved. Found in chapter 11, verse 26. And the Israel of God. Found in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. If we separate this from what we've looked at in the last several weeks, then we don't get that picture, that full picture, that crisp picture of just who the Israel Paul spoke of was. Because what have we learned thus far? Just because somebody is a descendant of Abraham doesn't make them Israel. And just because somebody's not a descendant of Israel doesn't mean that they can't not a descendant of Abraham doesn't mean that they can't be part of Israel. Because God is able to cut you and me out of wild olive trees and graft us into His olive tree. We don't replace Israel. We become one with Israel. We're looking at two verses. And in these two verses we see first part of verse 1, mercies or mercy of God. Second part of verse 1, your service to or for God. In verse 2, renewing your mind. And since it's a long section of Scripture, we'll just read both verses before we pray. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we go to the Lord in prayer, are you conformed or are you transformed? There is no middle ground. You are either conformed to this world and this age, or you are transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you. For your word and for your will. Lord, we thank you 
that you did not leave us as reprobates. You did not leave us blind and poor and pitiful and naked. You did not leave us off in the wild, but you brought us into your vineyard and made us part of your people. A fleshly mind might become prideful by that. But we know that there's nothing to be prideful about. Because you did not make us part of your people because of who we are or because of what we've done or because of any merit. You made us part of your people by your act of grace and mercy alone. And may we never forget <coughs> that our status, our position, our identity is found in you and accomplished by you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.
Isaiah chapter 63, verse 15. Isaiah 63, verse 15, and reading to the end of the chapter. Look down from heaven, and behold, from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength, the sounding of thy bowels, and of thy mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, Art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and hardened our heart from thy fear? Return for thy servants' sake, the tribes of thine inheritance, the people of thy holiness have possessed it. But a little while, our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them. They were not called by thy name. Isaiah referenced in verse 15 thy mercies toward me. Indeed, God has had, has shown many mercies toward you and me over the course of our lives. As you and me look back over the course of our lives, we can see many times we should have been, we should have been dead. We should not have made it through. And you can fill in the blank of your life that moment. But God showed His mercies toward you. Turn also to Hosea chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2 and verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and thou shalt call me no more Balim. For I will take away the names of Balim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the breast, with the beast of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword, and the battle out of the earth, and I'll make them to lie down safely. And I'll betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I'll betroth thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. Notice that mercy is coupled with loving kindness, or you could also call that compassion as well as righteousness and judgment. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord, and it shall come to pass in that day I will hear saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people. 
and they shall say, Thou art my God. The mercies that Hosea spoke of were coupled with loving kindness, with compassion, judgment, and righteousness. Those mercies included the reality that Hosea is speaking to Israelites. To Israelites who had sinned against God and God had cut them off. To people, they were formerly God's people, but now they were not God's people. And Hosea promises that they will be God's people again. If we look at mercy singular, it shows the quality of God by which He delivers man from sin and underlies His saving activity in Christ. So mercies are all the ways in which God works in your life to bring you to the moment you are right now. Mercies are all the ways in your life that God points you to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mercy, singular, is that quality of God by which He delivers you from sin. And this underlies His saving activity in Christ. Mercy here is saving activity in Christ. Are you saved? Have you come to the foot of the cross? Has God exposed your sin for what it is? And have you looked your sin face to face and called it what God calls it? That's confession. Have you then turned from that sin and to the Savior? Surrendering to Him as Lord. That is His activity. Divine mercy, biblically speaking, is the basis for man to respond with sacrifice. In the Old Testament, mercy was always followed with the response of sacrifice. Man knew, the Israelite knew that he was a sinner. And he knew that the price had to be paid. And God set that price. And so the Israelite would bring the offering, the sacrifice. That was his response. God said, you are a sinner. And you will be judged. But make a sacrifice and that sacrifice will atone your sin will be poured onto that sacrifice and mercy will be extended to you second part of verse 1 we see your service to or for God. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Body includes both the person and the bodily powers set apart for God's use. Both 
what folks can see when they see you, what you see when you look in the mirror, and the powers available within your body. Paul is clear here because the Greeks viewed the body as merely a receptacle containing the soul. So for the Greek, the body was merely utilitarian. No value in that body except to hold the content of your soul. Indeed, in the 2nd and 3rd century, Gnosticism would creep in, which was a result of Greek thinking and philosophy, which viewed the body as bad and the soul good. But Paul is very clear as he writes not just to Jews, but to the Greeks, when he says, present your body as living sacrifices. It's not just a receptacle for your soul. It is created by God to be used for His purposes. The Jew, the Hebrew, in Paul's audience, understood this. Because the Hebrew understood man as a complete unit. The Hebrew understood that body and soul are one unit. One complete unit. You can't have a soul without a body, and you can't have a body without a soul. Holy. We don't quite grasp what holy is in today's culture, do we? Holy is the act of renouncing sin. What do you say about sin? Oftentimes, we as Christians are really good at telling what we're against. And, what, and we're not very good at telling what we're for. Oftentimes, we're really good at speaking out against the sins of the world, but we're not all that great about addressing our own sin. If you and me are to be holy, we must renounce sin and commit to obedience. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? If I be a master, where is my fear? Said the Lord of hosts unto you. O priest that despise my name. And ye say, Wherein have we, have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon an altar. And ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto your God. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person? Said the Lord of hosts. And now I pray you, beseech God that He will be gracious unto us. This 
hath been by your means. Will he regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, in that ye say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness is it. And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a bell and vow and sacrifices unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. The Lord says, My name shall be great among the Gentiles. My name shall be great among the heathen. And finally, my name is dreadful among the heathen. Holy, holy, holy. Yes, is the Lord God Almighty. But, Holy is what He has called you and me to. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to Him. Renounce sin and commit to obedience. That is the task at hand for you and me. It's not a one and done thing. It's not done just at justification. Yes, you and me denounce sin at justification, but we renounce sin over and over through sanctification. Through sanctification, you and me commit ourselves to obedience. What does that look like in your life? What sin besets you? And each of us are different. So no two of us will be beset by the same sin. Renounce it and commit to obedience. Reasonable service, or as some translations say, spiritual, even act of worship. What is this reasonable service? Reasonable is intelligent or deliberate. The sacrifice that you render to God is intelligent and deliberate. You and me don't just wander into, into worship and say, okay, well, it's 10.30 on Sunday morning. I'm here because this is what I always do. No, you and me come before Him intelligently and deliberately. He informs our spirits, our 
hearts, our minds, intelligently, deliberately. Everett Harrison says, In Israel, the whole burnt offering ascended to God and could never be reclaimed. It belonged to God. Think about that. Paul has just said here, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He's contrasting what you and me offer as those to whom Christ is revealed with those burnt offerings of the Old Testament. Those Old Testament offerings were brought by Israel and the whole thing was consumed. It was consumed for the Lord and it could never be reclaimed. As I was thinking about, about this verse, we don't normally think of this verse with regard to salvation as far as keeping salvation. But that burnt offering never being able to be reclaimed Guess what? When you and me are offered to God as living sacrifices, we can't reclaim our lives. We can't reclaim our bodies for ourselves. Once they are claimed for God, they are His, and you and me can never <coughs> reclaim them. Not generally a verse used to teach perseverance of the saints or eternal security or once saved, always saved. But it's there. Once you are dedicated to God as a living sacrifice, you cannot then reclaim your life, your body for yourself. Verse 2. Renewing your mind. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. One thing that I noticed, and I checked the other translations, I checked the ESV, I checked the NASB, I checked the NIV, I checked RSV. But every single translation, King James and modern translations, all use the word world. Be not conformed to this world. But what's interesting is that the Greek uses the word Ioni. If you're saying world, Think about Russian cosmonauts or cosmetology. Not cosmetology as in makeup, but cosmetology. Cosmology. <laughs> cosmology. Would, cosmetology would be makeup. Cosmology. Cosmology references the world. Cosmology, biology, comes from the Greek word cosmos. World. Ioni is actually best translated as age. But all the translations translate Ioni here as world. Think about it like this. Be not conformed to this, to the age of this world. Be not conformed to the age of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're not living for this age are we? We are living for the 
age to come. Be not conformed to the age of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of, the, of your mind for the age to come. Look, for your Redeemer is nigh. We believe in the imminent, not necessarily soon coming, but the imminent return of Christ. <clears throat> Renewing your mind, you are delivered from this present evil age. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me, and to the churches of Galatia. Grace be unto you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. That verse 4 is, is crucial here. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world, from this present evil age, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So he delivers you from this present, from the present evil age of this world, to whom be glory forever and ever in the age to come. Turn back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Just one letter back. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not talking craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience and to the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them. They're lost. And whom the God of this world <coughs> hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, for, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 4 says, In whom the God of the, this age and the age of this world, that's, that's a lowercase g there, has blinded the minds of them which believe not. So in renewing your mind, you are delivered from this present evil age. You live out of the power of the age to come. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4. <coughs> for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and, made, been made, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the world for age to come if they shall fall away and renew them again under repentance seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain cometh off upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat to them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is not a curse whose end is to be burned. Alright, now there are some folks who use this text, out of context, no doubt, but they use this text to build their case that it is possible for somebody to apostatize. 
but the writer to the Hebrews is speaking hypothetically here. If they shall fall away. He doesn't say that they do fall away, but he says if they do fall away, it would be impossible to renew them. And how many times have you heard folks that teach apostasy then try to evangelize again somebody that they claim has lost their salvation? Well, if they really practice what they preach, then they would have to admit that the one that they claim has lost their salvation is done for. There's no getting it back. The verse 5 shows that you live by the power of the age to come. You tasted the good word of God. And the powers of the age of the world to come. And then you are in the world as a witness. First Corinthians. We've already been to Second Corinthians, now to First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter seven and verse twenty nine. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse twenty nine. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. You're in this world for a set period of time. Indeed, it is appointed in the man once to die. You're not going to die one second or one later, one, one second earlier or one second later than the time appointed for you by God. While you're in this world, you will have opportunities. Opportunities that are not easy. God will give you opportunities by which to live out as a witness for the world. You are commanded by God to proclaim the good news verbally and that your actions would verify your words. Edward Harrison says once again, dedication leads to discernment and discernment to delight in God's will. Has God dedicated you to Himself? Has God granted you discernment to understand His Word and His will? And more importantly, are you delighting in God's will? Do you delight in God? What brings you joy? What brings you contentment? What brings you peace? Are you delighting in God because He dedicated you and because He granted you discernment to understand His will and His word? There is an intimate connection between certifying the will of God and making oneself a living sacrifice. And it is indicated in the use of pleasing in each case. We won't take time to turn there, but you can write down Philippians 4, verse 18, as well as Hebrews 13, verse 16. Good theology is practical. And when we practice good theology, 
then you, are, you and me are known as redeemed. You must be known as redeemed. You are known as redeemed by practicing good theology. By having biblical practices that are truly theological. All theology is practical. And all biblical practice is theological. Are you known as redeemed of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for that which you called us to. We thank you that you revealed Christ to us. And in revealing Christ to us, you called us to respond. To your mercies. And specifically that mercy. With our bodies as living sacrifices. Not haphazardly, not flippantly, but intelligently and deliberately. not done in self-righteousness, but done in humility, in repentance, and in faith. Lord, I pray that we would be known as holy. That we would live not with an attitude of holier than thou, but live with an attitude and an acknowledgement of biblical holiness. Renouncing sin and committed to obedience. Lord, you placed us in this age, in this world. But this world is not our home. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And we are here, 
as your witness. And may, may we take your commission seriously. In Jesus' name, Amen. Are you known as redeemed? Have you come face to face with your sin? Said the same thing about that God says and, sur and surrendered to Him as Lord.